Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. and welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. I want to welcome back Joe Kopsik, my author, my lecturer, and who's been on our show before. So happy to have you return, Joe. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Every time I see Joe, he has written another book. I can't even get my first one written yet. I don't know how you get so many books. You have um, uh, soft communism for the 90s for kids, libertarian uh, conspiracy theories. You have another one out, which the print's a little too tiny. I can't see it. But Time, Money, Moon, and Value. Oh my God, how many books can you read? And you're such a young man mm -hmm. to have all these books out. But today we're going to have something that I think is important to discuss because you're always hearing terminology thrown around. Oh, you're a fascist. You're an anarchist. You're a populist. He's a, a nationalist. He's a neo-nationalist. He's a libertarianism. You're, you're, a, uh, you're this, this, and this. And, and a lot of people, they hear the, this terminology and really nobody really knows. You know, I mean, I don't say nobody. I mean, you know, and some people that are, of course, uh, into politics. But the average viewer um, we hear this terminology all the time, and uh, you're, or you're a racist, or you're this, or you're that. We, we need to discuss what are these things, and I know that you're the man to come to when it comes to what's an anarchist, what's a fascist, what's a socialist, and we're going to be talking about that today. I'm so glad that I have found you, because you can explain all this to our viewers. So, Joe. Let's start with, um, we got so this is the letter A, what is an anar anarchist? And I want to tell you, uh, Joe's a, um, he's a lecturer and he's a author and he, um, he he's, he's really amazing. And he, if anybody knows these answers, it will be you. Well, what anarchists want is a stateless society. If you ask an anarchist of the left, who's more of the socialist or communist persuasion, they'll say they want a world without hierarchy. Uh, they point to bankers, uh, landlords, um, and and government, and uh, you know military, um, big businesses as the biggest source of exploitation of people and land and resources. Um, but if you ask a right libertarian what anarchism is, they'll tell you it's about statelessness, it's about um, a total absence of government, uh, control of free will, liberty, of uh, voluntary decision making, freedom to enter into a contract. For them, it's more about anti-government, but. Socialists and communists are a little more open to having a government, at least for a temporary, uh, temporary purposes. Ah, so now I know you're a libertarian, and a lot of people, you know, we come from our families. Most of our families are either Democrats or Republicans. Uh, a little bit later in time, became the, um, you know, uh, people right in the middle. They say they're in the middle. They're more. Uh, you know, they are an independent, but a lot of people don't know, uh, I know you're going to be talking a lot about what libertarians think about, and what is a libertarian? Maybe, because um, your last book, and we had you here, was called Libertarian Conspiracy Theories, 45 Essays of the Libertarian Right, oh my God, but, um, you know, what is a libertarian? What, what is the viewpoint of libertarian? Um, and then we can understand some of these other terminologies. Well, the, the, biggest, um, the biggest idea in libertarianism is that um, individuals are the best people to choose what to do with our money, what to do with our property, how we can relate socially to people, who we want to work for, whether we want to join a union, um, marriage, you know, 
we, we want to do whatever kind of free, peaceful, non, you know, harmless activity uh, that, that doesn't bother anyone else. We want to conduct those affairs without government involvement. And what that means politically is having, um, is having mostly voluntary participation in most government programs and uh, allowing people to opt out if, they, if there's a government program that they don't like. So it's like uh, just recently, um, one of the government programs was uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court just ruled on unions that if you work at a company and they make, if you don't want to join the union, you don't have to join a union. Is that sort of a, a libertarian uh, uh, type of thing that... Uh, it, it almost is. Um, the problem is that uh, they're, they're still paying, well, they're, they don't have to pay dues, but they're still receiving the quote-unquote benefits of union representation. They might say that those things aren't benefits to them because they don't like their union, um, but, you know. Or they don't want to pay for their union because that comes out of their paycheck. Yeah, and uh, I think right-to-work laws kind of only put a Band-Aid on the problem, which is 80-year-old federal labor laws that require the majority union, you know, which might be kind of complacent with management. You never know. They might not be, you know, so radical or have the interests of the working people at heart. And whatever union gets the majority gets to represent all workers and has to represent all workers to management, whether they pay dues or not. So the Janus decision just fixes half the problem and then breaks the other half, but, you know, it creates another problem. But right to work are not the solution, and Friedrich Hayek knew, knew that. And right now we have a governor candidate for libertarians uh, is running against uh, right to work laws, but also running against the big union domination of our public sector. So, so at least they got accomplished one thing, that if they really don't want to, uh, it isn't mandatory that if you, you know, so, what, I mean, if somebody's paying for their union and somebody else isn't paying for their union, yet they both get uh, they, they get taken care of the same way, is is that fair? Or how do you see it? I mean, as a libertarian, how do you see that? I mean, I can understand uh, where you don't have to belong to a union; uh, you have that choice. But why give them representation if they don't want to join it? Because most of the time, when you join something, like at a meeting, when you join anything, there's some time, type of dues that you have to pay. And the reason you pay the dues, because you get representation from that particular organization. But if the person isn't going to join, the, say, a union, uh, they don't want to join, uh, say, the representative, say, the Teamster Union, and they don't want to pay their dues, um, then why do they still get represented? represented uh, if something happens to their job or they get ill or something and they need to collect benefits and stuff should they have still the same rights to those who pay well you know it's it's this is a really sticky situation because the you know the, the free rider problem is created by the federal government it's not created by the free riders themselves the free riders they don't want to be a free riders they don't want to pay for the union representation they're getting because they don't like it and they don't feel it personally benefits them so I think what we need to do is uh, is look towards the labor union negotiation model of Japan and also look towards a thing called members only uh, collective bargaining where people can elect to join any union they please and where minor minority unions are still allowed to exist, you know, and not be potentially sued out of existence by the majority union, uh, which then has to represent everyone, regardless of whether people pay. Yeah, it, it is an unfair system. Uh, the federal labor law creates the problem in the first place, and then right to work fails to solve it. And that's why I don't support either of those. Okay, so libertarians don't support either, because you're representing the libertarians. Is it just you, or is it libertarians that don't support either? Well, there are some libertarians, probably a lot, who do support right-to-work laws because they are at least, um, you know, taking the Tenth Amendment and the states' rights aspect of it. But um, people like Friedrich Hayek and myself feel that um, right-to-work laws, they limit the types of contracts that unions and management are able to make with each other. And uh, even though that might potentially negatively affect someone who might come to work for them that, you know, eventually, we don't feel that it would be appropriate to just say your contract that you made between, you know, a private union and a private management, we don't want to say, you know, the government can come along and make your contract invalid. That should be honored, even though we might not like the consequences of it, like wage stagnation might be an example. Hmm. 
So, um, so that you're, you're representing the, the the libertarian point of view. Now, what it, would an anarchist think? We could we could even we could use the model of unions, you know, or anything else. What would an anarchist think? And we're going to go what a fascist thinks. Mm. So, what would an anarchist think? in the same thing. And explain anarchism. What is anarchism again? Well, that all depends on, on who you ask, and that's why I wrote this, uh, you know, one book about libertarianism on the right and the other book of libertarianism uh, on the left. And the libertarian left is more strongly associated with, uh, you know, the European anarchism of the, of the 19th century and then uh, the, the kind of market, the pro-market, pro-individualist, pro um, classical liberal kind of emulated the anarchism and kind of came after that and came to be known as libertarianism. So there's kind of two, two schools. Um, but the traditionalist anarchists, uh, they're anti-government in addition to being anti-hierarchy, exploitation, and they want to abolish private property. And that doesn't mean they want to abolish like personal possessions like this mug or a book or a newspaper or a toothbrush. They want to abolish private property as Pierre Joseph Proudhon defined it, which is a specific thing, meaning things that are used to, to exact uh, interest and rent and profit from people, um, the ownership of you know, land, factories, and, and farms, and large swaths of land, and you know, large chunks of the labor force uh, in, in order to get more money from people and demand, uh, demand more, more money from them every year. And, and so what would now, what would, okay, we got an anarchist viewpoint. What about the fascist viewpoint on the unions? Um, well, I, I should address the anar anarchist views of the unions first. Oh, okay. Um, so in, in 1924, the IWW, which is the Industrial Workers of the World, uh, it was a it's a Chicago-founded union founded in 1905, and they were against, uh, th they still exist, um, they were against the idea that the government should be involved in, in negotiating union disputes at all in the first place. And that's why they split with the progressives who pursued a political solution, which is to have the federal government negotiate labor disputes. Well, the labor movement is finding that every time there's a Republican in charge, he can put whoever he wants on the National Labor Relations Board, and that can just, it, it, it causes, if someone, if someone has antipathies towards unions in their office and they, they are doing this, it's not going to work out well for unions. So maybe organizing, you know, on, on, the, on a face-to-face -face level and, and organizing for worker autonomy and independence, uh, maybe that's better than a political solution. That's what an anarchist would say. Fascists are just basically against, well, they're against most unions. They, they might support unions if it's useful to have, if it's useful to retain capitalism while maintaining an appearance of a social safety net. Um, so what is a fascist? Give me the definition of a fascist, and then we'll talk more on the union thing. Well, um, in ancient Rome, uh, fascists, uh, I, I think it was a branch of, I mean, aristocracy. It's a, I, I don't know too much about that, but in terms of the 20th century, uh, the closest thing to a fascist was Mussolini, who was trying to revive that ancient, uh, ancient Roman fascism. Uh, fascism, it, it literally comes from the symbol, the fasces, which is an axe, a uh, symbol of an axe bound with, uh, bound with um, twine or wood, and it was a symbol of uh, uniting people and bringing them together. But um, in the general sense, fascism is synonymous with authoritarianism. Uh, it was the ideology of everyone who, who aligned with Mussolini and Hitler and Franco and World War II and the Japanese imperialists. And their authoritarianism and fascism are very anti-liberty, anti-free market, anti-freedom philosophies. Now, it, I'm going to go to, I know we have socialism, but how does fascism uh, uh, different than nationalism? You hear of nationalism all the time, too. What it, is a fascist a nationalist, or, or what, what exactly is that? Well, a nationalist is someone who wants to protect their country's right to uh, make the, the, uh, decisions independently, whether that's economic or political. Um, but a fascist is basically just a hyped up ultra nationalist who's taken their nationalism and infused it with racism and maybe religious, uh, um, um, and maybe, uh, excuse me, re um, religious prejudice. And, uh, and they might want to start wars and, uh, and, you know, establish some kind of hierarchy where they have second class citizens. I get. I see. So, uh, so, so there is there different types of like neo nationalism, or is it, you know, you hear of neo nationalists too, there or ultra right, you know, the alt right. You hear that expression as well. 
Yeah, there's all kind of kinds of blends. Um, there's a lot of alt-right people who are trying to pretend they're libertarians, and they're just seizing on to the fact that uh, libertarians, that there are a lot of them who are leaning towards capitalism, and some libertarians seem to have been tricked into thinking that fascism is preferable to socialism. Of course, I hope we never have to make that choice. I'd love to live in a free society. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, th there's, there's all kinds of strange blends between, I mean, you can look up social patriotism, national syndicalism, social nationalism, the Stasi, I mean, um, national communism, uh, national bolshevism. There's all kinds of strange blends between na uh, nationalism and socialism. Oh my God, and I also want to say national socialism, even though it was called socialism, it doesn't compare to what most people describe as socialism, which is the dominant form, which is Marxian socialism. They were trying to emulate a kind of what's called Volkish or a, a socialism of the people from you know Germany hundreds of years ago. But they ended up, you know, murdering the socialists within their own ranks and, and uh, you know, making socialist parties illegal and using the name socialist and the color red to trick socialists into supporting the Nazi cause. They yeah, were not socialists. Because now you hear of the socialistic party, the socialism party. In fact, um, there was one uh, that we, that um, especially... Um, uh, the Democrats are planning down the path of, they said, socialism, especially after after Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez setting her, her primary win. And now they're comparing socialism to being what happened in Venezuela. And um, Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister, former pr Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher put it, is that you eventually socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money and what's happening in Venezuela people are now starving and they're trying to get into Colombia because of their own country this was a very very rich country Venezuela at one time and uh, they went down the path apparently they said to socialism and they went all the way down that everybody wanted everything uh, just keep feeding and giving everybody everything using, as Margaret Thatcher said, you eventually run out of other people's money, and that's what happened to uh, Venezuela. Um, and what do you think about that? Do you think that's going to happen um, to our country? Because a lot of our new candidates are call themselves socialists, you know, uh, democratic candidates leaning to socialism. Yeah, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders kind of marketed themselves as socialists, and I think they are inspired by socialism. Um, I think they want a robust social safety net, and, uh, and they want a welfare state. Um, but I think they want that within the context of liberal capitalism, or at least they know that that's as much as they're going to be able to negotiate for you know, running in a legitimate political system that's mostly capitalist and that favors capitalists and you know, neoliberals like Hillary Clinton. They want something that's more populist, more farther to, uh, farther to the left, and closer to the people, and closer to the actual center. Um, we've been fooled into thinking that you know, the actual center is more right than it is. Like, people who think Hillary Clinton is the left. I mean, Hillary Clinton is a capitalist. Nancy Pelosi said that she's a capitalist and the Democratic Party is capitalist. There's only a, a handful of Democrats and maybe, you know, Greens who are who I really consider socialists. And, you know, with those standards, I don't consider Venezuela fully socialist. I think they're definitely trying to be socialist, um, but they haven't made real moves towards abolishing money. And I think uh, the West and capitalism are a lot more responsible for some of their problems than a lot of people would care to admit. And I think that's the fault of food monopolies. And, but it's also part of the fault of the government for mismanaging um, oil. I mean, um, You're talking about Venezuela right now. Yeah. The Venezuela um, was very wealthy about 10 or 15 years ago because it, it, would, uh, it was taxing oil profits and using that to uh, fund a dividend for its people. Um, but after oil prices collapsed, uh, the country went into debt, and now it's having difficulty uh, getting food. And they have um, price controls on the food, so no one's willing to sell food in Venezuela at those low prices. So what do you what do you think happened? I mean, here was a country that was well, you know, uh, and and you look at it and think, if we're going to follow the Venezuela model, 
um, what's going to happen to us? Are we eventually going to run out of food? Are we going to are we going to start starving? Uh, you know, where are we going to get all the money? I mean, now they're still they're complaining about Social Security running out of money. I mean. Everything is running out of money, and if we keep giving everything to the people, uh, you know, they don't have to work, they don't have to, they get, you know, um, everything paid for, their health care, um, which, which isn't too bad because, uh, you know, but then they would get socialized medicine, which then they would have, they would start complaining that they have to wait months for a ultrasound or, an, you know, or, or go to something in radiology, one of the... Um, things in radiology they may need and, and um, what's going to happen I mean do you see our country going into the socialistic model I, I think it's uh, there's a good chance I mean um, Millennials will be voting in you know record numbers they'll be I, I think it's pretty much virtually guaranteed that uh, a Democrat is going to overtake Trump in 2020 and um, I think those populist and more left and more radical Democrats are going to kind of be at the forefront, or at least they'll be most popular among young people. Um, but I don't think they alone could really lead a country into socialism, um, definitely you know, much less in a, in a peaceful fashion. I think it would probably take a revolution, because what we're talking about in terms of transitioning from capitalism to socialism, you'd have to abolish the private property ownership. You'd have to basically get rid of most landlords, bankers, and the governments, uh, potentially all of them, uh, will also, you know, if you, you get wanna, rid of all the bankers, how are you going to get your money? Well, the communists would say and the socialists would say you don't need money to, uh, you know, to have trade. You can, uh, you know, gift, trade, barter, share. Uh, you can take things that are freely given. Uh, communists, the most extreme communists, believe in a completely marketless society where trade and competition are unnecessary. And I'm increasingly uh, being won over to that perspective. I think everyone's looking towards the government to make things cheap and affordable for them when markets could do that just as easily if we just get rid of all the you know, places where government stealing our money through taxes and giving it to cronies to prop up their businesses that we then have to pay for, uh, uh, buy their products and work for them. And tariffs? I'm against tariffs for the same reason I'm against sales taxes because they politicize trade and they uh, increase um, the cost of a product for no reason. The government doesn't earn anything to get that money. Uh, we should be taxing destructive activity, not peaceful trade. Hmm. My goodness. Um, now, populism. You know, our president has been known to be a populist. He's not a, you know, a lot of Republicans having problems because they don't, he's not following the Republican model as closely as somebody that was Republican. He obviously is not, re not and, and he was once a Democrat. So, you know, he, so now they're looking at him as a populist, sort of like um, Jackson, you know, the Jacksonian uh, who, they said was a populist. Do you see him as a populist? Do you see uh, that's what our country is more? And explain. I'm, I'm using the word populist. What is a populist, and yeah. how do you see it? I think the term like left-wing populist applies to people like Hugo Chavez and Bernie Sanders, and then right-wing populism applies to people like Trump. But I think uh, words like nationalist and mercantilist also apply to him pretty well. Mercantilists are kind of. Um, it's kind of halfway, I mean, it's, it's, it's more, it's kind of corporatist version of capitalism where a government gets to sponsor its own domestic industry. And that's something I'm against as a free market supporter. Um, but a populist can come in any variety, it can be left or right. And uh, if you ever read The Economist magazine, you'll know there, there's not just liberals, conservatives, libertarians, there's also something called a hard hat. And that is someone who is fiscally conservative, um, but kind of wants a big social safety net. And that includes like people like Sam McCann. Uh, he's kind of fiscally and socially conservative, but he's he's still a, he's running as a pro-union conservative. So it's the people who you know want the government to make sure the unions have enough and that government workers have enough, um, but they are not necessarily going to identify with the more socially liberal, uh, libertine, um, you know, social policies of the Democrats. And we have one more a communist. How does that, how did the communism run in? And then I want a little, little bit about you. So just give us a little bit about, I think most people think, you know, the communism during the uh, McCarthy, you know, the McCarthyism where uh, people in the, in theater and show business and if you, you know, they got ruined kind of, if they, they thought you were a communist during that time, people lost their jobs and, uh, 
people were called communists. So how does that communism and socialism, do they kind of blend together? Uh, well, Marx's position was that <clears throat> a socialist state uh, would lead to a communist society because you'd abolish the capitalist state and replace it with a socialist state, and then that socialist state would fade away into uh, stateless anarcho-communism. And um, so, but communists in the 1950s and the Red Scare, that was kind of used as a catch-all term for anyone who wanted to criticize American military policy, who wanted to criticize, you know, the corporate robber barons who had bought out the government and the educational system and were, you know, employing everyone, controlling everyone's lives and destiny and selling their debt in the international markets. But uh, there's authoritarian communism and there's libertarian communism. Uh, there's, you know, Stalin and Mao and maybe the Jacobins were examples of authoritarian communists. Um, but the USSR is not the best example of a free communist society. And uh, it's not even the best example of a communist society. They just collectivize the farms. Uh, they achieve a few things in terms of women's rights, gay rights, workers' rights, uh, industrialization, agriculture, space exploration. Um, but the best example of a free socialist society would be like Catalonia in Spain, uh, in northeast Spain, which is trying to become independent. I'm not saying they're perfect. There's also a town called Mondragon, Spain, which has set up the uh, Mondragon Cooperative Corporation, which sells things and has uh, has locations all over the world. And uh, there's also a place in Kurdistan called Rojava, where there's uh, feminists who have created an army and are trying to run it on principles of libertarian socialist Murray Bookchin. My goodness, I feel like I've opened an encyclopedia. I think, I think you're my guest from the Encyclopedia Botanica. Um, Tell me a little bit about your background while we still have a few more minutes, Joe. How do you know all these things? You're only 31 years old, and you seem to know more about things than most of us have lived a lifetime already. Mm -hmm. how, did you, how did you get interested in all the, this politics and you know, professionalism, and where did you, you know, how did you get all this? And, and how could people you know, um, see, find your books or what have you? Well, I first got interested in politics around the time the uh, Clinton Lewinsky scandal was happening when I was 14. Um, you know, 9 11 happened a little while after I got into high school, so I just, you know, dove into the news, tried to learn as much as I can about, you know, why this happened, what was going on. Uh, I was raised by Democrats. Um, I became a libertarian in 2007 after I had supported the Greens a lot in high school. And uh, I turned my college writings into a blog, and I turned the, that uh, blog into two books. Soon to be, hopefully, ten books if I get them uh, oh my get goodness. everything together. Ten books! Oh my goodness! If I have you on the show, I'm, you, all you have me is reading, reading, and reading. Mm -hmm. That's why I never get anywhere. I keep reading all your books. Mm -hmm. So I have, but larger print next time. Sure. <laughs> Actually, I had to buy a new pair of glasses just to be able to.